All the information you need to create new blocks can be found on the developer's website. This API is extensive, very flexible, but not the easiest to understand. A better way is to use the block factory. The block factory can be found at the bottom of the list of demos. It is a Blockly application that allows you to use Blockly to create Blockly blocks. This black shape is the block that we are creating. It is a live preview and it will modify as we build the block. The block factory automatically generates code that you can copy and paste into your application. The language code specifies how to render the block's shape. The generator stub is a starting point for turning the block into JavaScript, Python, or Dart. Let's start by building a block. The easiest thing to do is to give it a color. As you can see, the color of our new block has immediately changed. Also, the relevant setColor function call has been added to the language code. Next, let's add some inputs. There are three different types of inputs. We'll start with a value input. The value input adds a notch on the right-hand side of the block to which we can connect other blocks. Inputs can have fields on them. The simplest field is a text field. Let's duplicate this input so that we have three of them. The first thing you'll see is a bunch of warnings. These warn that there are three input blocks of the same name. Each input should have a unique name within the scope of this block so that the code generator can access any connected blocks. Let's rename these inputs to red, green, and blue and set the text fields to match. Now the warnings are gone. Another name that is important is the block's name. This name should be unique across all of Blockly. To avoid collisions, it is customary to prefix a block's name with its category. If there are multiple rows of fields, one may wish to change the alignment of the fields. In this case, all the fields are left aligned. We can right align them or center them to make a more pleasing layout. An important consideration is how to plug this block into other blocks. The connections menu provides several options. Left output is intended for value blocks where this block computes some value that gets fed into the block it is connected to. And the remaining options are for statements. Top and bottom connections is the most common for statements. It allows the block to be part of a stack of statements. Less commonly, one might just have a top connection. This is for blocks that have no following statements. For example, a return block or an infinite loop block. Finally, one might just have a bottom connection. This is for blocks that start execution. For example, an event handler. Let's switch this block back to a left output. Inputs can come in two different forms. External inputs, as you see here, where the inputs are stacked vertically, and inline inputs, where the inputs are rendered horizontally. Inline inputs are quite useful for blocks that would otherwise become quite cumbersome, such as a multiplication block. This block with inline inputs looks right, whereas the same block with external inputs looks ridiculous. Another type of input is the statement input. These allow you to connect a stack of statement blocks inside your block. This is typically used for if statements and loops. Let's build an if statement. We could modify this to be a while do loop quite easily. Or, with a single drag, we could modify this to be a do while loop where the test is at the end. The last type of input is a dummy input. This creates an empty row that can contain fields without being associated with a connection to other blocks. 
For example, we could add some text and move it anywhere we want in our block. There are many different types of fields to choose from. We've already seen text fields. They provide static text on a block. A more interactive field is a text input field. Here the user is allowed to type anything they want. Text input fields allow one to specify the default text which appears when a block is first created. Like all interactive fields, text inputs require a name that is unique to this block. This name is used by the generator to access the user provided data contained within that field. In the interest of time, we will ignore field names in the rest of this video, so don't worry about the warning icons that will be appearing once we have more than one field with the same name. The next type of field is the angle input. Angle inputs do what the name implies. They allow the user to choose an angle from 0 to 360 degrees. A more complicated field is the drop-down field. This contains a list of options that are human-readable, along with a corresponding list of option names that are machine-readable. This separation is designed to support multiple languages. Let's consider the example of red, green, and blue. This same block in German would use options labeled rot, grün, and blau. French would use rouge, vert, and bleu. To allow program logic to work across different languages, each option has a language neutral version that does not change. Typically, this is just the English version in uppercase, but it is really quite arbitrary. Let's keep this example really simple and just use R, G, and B. Now, when the user selects green from the drop-down, the code generator will report that the user chose G. Another feature of drop-down fields is that it automatically factors out common prefixes and suffixes. Let's say that we had is red, is green, and is blue. The common prefix of is is trimmed off the options and inserted as a static text field. Likewise, if there were a common suffix, it would be appended here. This is extremely useful for creating multilingual applications since there are fewer out-of-context word fragments to translate. The next type of field is a checkbox. Pretty simple. You can set the default of whether it is checked or not. The next field is color. This allows the user to choose from a palette of colors. By default, there are 70 colors to choose from, but this may be customized to allow for a greater or a more limited selection. The next field is a variable. This is a drop-down field that is automatically populated with a list of all the variables used in the program thus far. It also provides options for renaming variables and creating new ones. Let's use a variable to make a while loop. The final field is an image. Images can be of any web-friendly format. Just put in the URL of the image. Images are scaled to fit within the dimensions provided, but the aspect ratio is never changed. The alt text is used when the user collapses a block and the image is replaced with text.
The final feature of the block factory is the ability to specify types. Let's look at an example. A string block should be able to plug into a length block, but it should not be able to plug into a square root block. An equality block should be able to plug into a repeat block, but it should not be able to plug into a length block. Every connection should have type information that specifies allowed values. Let's build an example, a math block that negates a number. The value input on the right side of the block currently has no type information, so it will accept anything. Now the input can only accept a block that returns a number. Likewise, the output on the left side of the block currently has no type information, so it can be plugged into anything. Now the output can only be plugged into a block that accepts a number. Let's build another example, a length block. As before, the output is typed as a number, but the input needs to accept either a string or a list. These built-in types are completely arbitrary. You can create your own types as needed. Let's build a block that returns the number of seconds until a specified date. Just create a new type and call it whatever you want. In the same way that value inputs and outputs may be typed, statement connections may also be typed. This is extremely rarely used in Blockly. In fact, the core blocks never use this feature, since any statement may follow any other statement. But an example of its use is visible here in the block factory. Notice that fields cannot be plugged into input stacks. And likewise, inputs may not be plugged into field stacks. This is achieved by adding type information to the top and bottom connectors, as well as to the statement connectors. This concludes our tour of the block factory. Most blocks can be created here, and then the code copied and pasted into your program. For more dynamic blocks that use mutators, you'll have to read the API documentation and check out the existing examples. One last point is that when you finish creating a block in the block factory, it is a good idea to grab a link to this block and save it in your code. That way you can come back to your block in the future and modify it without having to recreate everything. Have fun.